my dear students today i am going to deliver you a very special lecture on the third level the name of the text is the third level so without wasting any time let's start the third level written by jack finney Let's talk about the introduction first. The third level by Jack Finney is about the harsh realities of wars. It is about the, it is about the harsh realities of war. War has irreversible consequences, thus leaving people in a state of insecurity. It is also about modern day problems and how the common man tends to escape reality by various means. In this story, a man named Charlie hallucinates and reaches the third level of Grand Central Station, which only has two levels. Theme of the lesson, the third level presents a break from the pool of insecurity, fear, war, worry, and all the rest of it, modern world. The 1890s depict a tranquil lifestyle that is not feasible in the present. The main character wants to take his wife, Louisa, to Galesburg, Illinois, from this point on. While his psychiatrist friend refers to it as a waking dream, which fulfillment for him it is a part of reality. Now let's talk about the summary. The summary of third level. The story revolves around a 31 year old named Charlie. So the story is revolved around Charlie. Charlie and he is 31 year old. One day after war coming from the subway, he reached the third level of the Grand Central Station, which doesn't actually exist. He reminisces the entire experience with his psychiatrist friend Sam. Charlie thought he experienced time travel and had this somewhere in the 1890s, a time before the world saw two of its most deadliest wars. As soon as he realized what time he is in, he immediately decided to buy two tickets to Galesburg, Illinois, one for himself and other for his wife. Unfortunately, the currency used in that century was different. Thus, the next day he withdrew all his savings and got them converted, even if, even if it meant bearing losses. He went looking for the third level but failed to find it. It worried his wife and psychiatrist Sam who told him that he is hallucinating in order to take refuge from reality and miseries of the modern world which is full of worry. Charlie thus resorts to his stamp collection in order to distract himself when suddenly one day he finds a letter from his friend Sam who had gone missing recently. Sam wrote that he always wanted to believe in the idea of third level and now that he is there himself. He encourages Charlie and Louisa to never stop looking for it. The third level summary in Hindi. Now we will know Hindi. This story is Charlie named one of the first years of the year. He has done some strange things. One day, he came to the metro and came to the Grand Central Station to the third stage of the third stage which is not available in the past. वो अपने मनोचिकित्सक मित्र सैम के साथ पूरे अनुभव को याद करता है चार्ली ने सोचा कि उसने टाइम ट्रेवल का अनुभव किया है और उठा रहे से नब्बे के दशक में कहीं पहुंच गया था उस समय से पहले जब दुनिया ने अपने दो सबसे घातक युद्ध देश देखे थे पहला और दूसरा विश्व युद्ध जैसे ही उन्होंने महसूस किया कि वो किस समय में है उन्होंने तुरंत गिल्सबर्ग इलिनियास के लिए दो टिकट खरीदने का फैसला किया एक अपने लिए और दूसरा अपनी पत्नी के लिए दुर्भाग्य से उस सदी में इस्तेमाल की जाने वाली मुद्रा अलग थी इस प्रकार अगले दिन उन्होंने अपनी गाड़ी बचत इकट्ठी की और उन डॉलर के नोटों को परिवर्तित करवा दिया भले ही उसका मतलब नुकसान उठना ही क्यों ना है हो वो तीसरे स्तर की तलाश में गया लेकिन उसे खोजने में असफल रहा उसने उनकी पत्नी और मनोचिकित्सक सैम को चिंतित कर दिया जिन्होंने उन्हें बताया कि वो आधुनिक दुनिया की वास्तविकता और दुखों से शरण लेने के लिए मतिभ्रम कर रहे थे जो चिंता से भरा है इस प्रकार चार्ली खुद को विचलित करने के लिए अपने स्टाम्प संग्रह का सहारा लेता है जो है, है जब अचानक एक दिन उसे अपने अपने दोस्त सैम का एक पत्र मिलता है जो हाल ही में लापता हो गया था सैम ने अपने पत्र में लिखा है कि वो हमेशा तीसरे स्तर के विचार में विश्वास करना चाहता था और अब जब वो खुद वहा है तो वो चार्ली और लुहसा लुसा लुसा के कभी भी इसकी तलाश करना बंद नहीं करने के लिए प्रोत्साहित करता है सो दिस वॉज द थर्ड लेवल नाउ कम टू आर नेक्स्ट टॉपिक द टाइगर किंग द टाइगर किंग written by kalki without wasting any time let's start the tiger king written by kalki the tiger king written by kalki let's talk about the theme of the lesson there is no way to avoid it 
the theme of the lesson one important sentence is there is no way to escape a death which is a given destiny has unlimited power and is unavoidable nobody can alter fate men in position of authority are cruel to animals they murder defenseless animals under various justifications the maharaja kills the tiger since the astrologer predicted that a tiger will be cause of his demise he kills them in order to avoid dying the tiger king introduction let's talk about the introduction the story is a satire on rich and powerful kings of the olden times in order to prove the prophecies of the fortune teller wrong the king pratibandha puram mindlessly kills 99 tigers but the 100th one the cause of the king's death escapes his bullet Ultimately the king is killed by an inanimate tiger made of wood hence the prophecy turns to be true despite the king's efforts to prove it wrong The Tiger King summary The Tiger King is the story of King Jang Jang Bahadur of Pratibandapuram a brave warrior whose death had been predicted when he was born the chief astrologer had predicted as the royal child was born in the on in the hour of the bull the tiger being its enemy death the tiger the chief astrologer had predicted as the royal child was born in the hour of bull The brave prince, the brave prince asked all tigers to be aware of him. He came to be known as Tiger King. The prince became tig- tig- became king at the age of twenty. So the prince became king at the age of twenty. And considering killing a cow in self-defense to be lawful, went on a tiger killing spree. He was warned of danger from the hundred tiger that he encountered. as all the tigers in his kingdom had been killed by him but still he had to kill more he married into his king having a high population of tigers when his killings reached 99 he desperately sought the next hand fearing the king's harshness the minister planted an old tiger in the forest for him to kill the king fired at it but the tiger escaped the bullet miraculously the royal hunters feared the king and so did not inform him rather they killed the beast themselves the king was satisfied that he had evaded death and now celebrated his son's third birthday The king was satisfied that he had every day that now celebrated his son's third birthday. He got an he got a wooden toy car, toy tiger as a gift for the prince. Although it was poorly done, the shopkeeper, fearing punishment under the rules of emergency, charged a high price. As both the king and his son were playing with the tiger, one of them, one of the thin pieces of wood that were erupting out of the wooden tiger, like feathers, pierced the king's right hand. The wound became infectious, infectious, spread through his arm, and as he was being operated upon, he died. So ironically, the hundred tiger killed the king, and eventually. टू किस रेवेंज द टाइगर किंग समरी इन हिंदी टाइगर किंग प्रतिबंधपुरम के राजा जंग जंग बहादुर की कहानी है जो एक बहादुर योद्धा था जिसकी मृत्यु की भविष्यवाणी उनके जन्म के समय में ही की गई थी मुख्य ज्योतिषी ने भविष्यवाणी की थी कि सही बच्चे का जन्म वाले जन्म वेल के समय में हुआ है और बाघ उसका दुश्मन है यानी कि बच्चे की मौत एक बाघ से होगी बल राजकुमार जो कि बहुत बहादुर था उसने सभी बाघों को उससे सावधान रहने के को कहा उन्हें बाघ राजा की रूह में जाना जाने लगा राजकुमार 20 साल की उम्र में राजा बन गए थे और आत्मरक्षा में गांव को मरने के बेत मनकर बाघ को मरने की होड़ में चले गए उसे अपने सामने आए सबो बाघ से खतरे की चेतावनी ही दी गई थी क्योंकि उसके राज्य के सभी बाघों को उसका द्वारा मार दिया गया था लेकिन फिर भी उससे और अधिक बाघों को मरना था उसने बाघों की अधिक आबादी वालों राज्य में शादी की जब उनकी हत्या निन्वान्य तक पहुंच गई तो उन्होंने अगले शिकार की सख्त तलाश की राजा की कठोरता के डर से मंत्री ने उसे मरने के लिए जंगल में एक बूढ़ा बाघ छोड़ दिया राजा ने उस पर गोली चलाई लेकिन बाघ चमत्कारिक रूप से गोली से बच निकला सही शिकारी राजा से डरते थे और इसलिए उन्होंने उसे सूचित नहीं किया बल्कि उन्होंने खुद जानवर को मार डाला राजा संतुष्ट था कि सो बा, सौ बाघ मार के अब वो मृत्यु से बच गया था और अब अपने बेटे का तीसरा जन्मदिन उसने धूमधाम से मनाया उसे राजकुमार के लिए उपहार के रूप में एक लकड़ी का लकड़ी का खिलौना बाघ मिला हालांकि वो खराब तरीके से बनाया गया था दुकानदार ने आपातकाल के नियमों के तहत सजा के डर से खिलौने की एक अच्छी कीमत वसूल की
जब राजा और उसका पुत्र दोनों खिलौने बाघ के साथ खेल रहे थे लकड़ी के पतले टुकड़े में से एक जो लकड़ी के वाक से निकल रहा था राजा की दाहिने हाथ में छेद कर रख गया घाव संक्रामक हो गया राजा की बाहों में जहर फैल गया और जैसे ही उसका अपरेशन किया जा रहा था उसकी मृत्यु हो गई तो विद्वानों यह है कि सबो बाघों ने राजा को मार डाला और अंतत 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 अपना बदला ले लिया सो दिस वॉज टाइगर किंग जाने को एंड ऑफ द आर्थ रिटर्न बाई किशन दोषी Journey to the end of the earth, written by Tishani Doshi. Without an external, let's talk about the introduction. The lesson revolves around the world's most preserved place, Antarctica. World's most preserved place, Antarctica. Not many people have been have given there, but out of the few that have, Tishani Doshi is one of them. A South Indian person who went on an expedition with a group of villagers affiliated with the students on ice program. takes young minds to different ends of the world thus it gives an insight into how antarctica is the place you should visit to have a glimpse of the past present and future in its realist form theme of the lesson an informative account of the author's trip to the world's oldest windest and driest continent can be found in the vistas book for class 12 entitled journey to the end of the earth according to tishani doshi visiting antarctica is necessary if one wants to comprehend the past present and future of the planet We can learn a lot about this area by studying it because Antarctica is where the world's geological story is preserved. She traveled with a group of students who were exploring the continent. Her encounter with the ice mysteries of this ice region was exhilarating. Journey to the end of the earth summary for a South Indian man traveling to Antarctica from Madras it takes nine time zone zone six checkpoints three water bodies and just as many ecospheres to reach there. Tishani Doshi traveled to the southern end of the earth along with an expedition group named Students on Ice. So, what was the name of the group? The name of the group was Students on Ice. So, students on Ice. That provides an opportunity to the young minds to sensitize towards the realistic version of climatic changes happening in the world. According to the founder of organization, we are the young versions of future policy makers who can turn the situation around. Antarctica is one of the coldest, driest, and windiest continents in the world. As far as the eyes can see, it is completely white, and it's An interrupted blue horizon gives immense relief. It is shocking to believe that India and Antarctica were part of the same supercontinent, Gondwana, that got segregated into countries, giving rise to the globe we know today. Antarctica had a warmer climate until then. Despite human civilization around the globe, it still remains in its pure form. Being a South Indian sun worshipping guy, it was unimaginable for the author to visit the place that constitutes world's 90% of ice, a place so quiet that it is only interrupted by snow avalanches. in this home it is home to a lot of evidences that can give us a glimpse of the past and at the same time antarctica helps us foresee the future the place gives an awakening to threatening alarm that global warming is actually real who knows if antarctica will be warm again and even if it does will we be alive to see it jane to the end of the earth samari ko ab hindi mein padhenge madras se antarctica ki yatra karne wali ek dakshin bharatiya vyakti ke liye waha tak pahunchne ke liye ne samay khetra cha chokiya तीन जल निकाय और उन उतने ही पारिस्थितिक क्षेत्र लगते हैं किशानी दोषी ने स्टूडेंट्स ऑन अन स्टूडेंट्स ऑन आइस नामक एक अभियान समुद्र के साथ पृथ्वी के दक्षिणी छोर की यात्रा की जो युवा दिमागों के दुनिया में है रहे जलवायु परिवर्तन के यथार्थवादी संस्करण के प्रति संवेदनशील बन, बनाने का अवसर प्रदान करता है संगठन के संस्थापक के अनुसार हम भविष्य के नीति निर्माता ओ के युवा संस्करण है जो स्थिति के बदल सकते हैं अंटार्कटिका दुनिया के सबसे ठंडे सबसे शुष्क और और हवा वाले महाद्वीपों में से एक है यहाँ तक जहाँ तक आंखें देख सकती है ये पूरी तरह से सफेद हो और इसका निर्बोध निर्बात नीला खेतीज बेहद राहत देता है वह यह विश्वास करना चौंकाने वाले हैं कि भारत और अंटार्कटिका भारत और अंटार्कटिका 
उसी सुपर कॉन्टिनेंट गंडवाना का हिस्सा थे जो आज हम जिस विश्व के जानते हैं उसे जन्म देने वाले देशों में विभाजित हो गए हैं। इस समय तक अंटार्कटिका की जलवायु गर्म थी दुनिया भर में मानव सभ्यता के बदलाव के बावजूद वो अभी भी अपने शुद्र रूप क्षुद्र रूप में बनी हुई है दक्षिण भारतीय सूर्य पूजा करने वाले व्यक्ति होने के नाते लेखक के लिए इस स्थान का द्वारा करना अकल्पनीय था जो दुनिया की 90 प्रतिशत बर्फ का निर्माण करता है एक ऐसा स्थान जो इतना शांत है कि वह केवल हिमस्खलन से बाधित है वो बहुत सारे सबूतों का घर है जो हमें अतीत की एक झलक दे सकता है और साथ ही अंटार्कटिका हमें भविष्य की भविष्यवाणी करने में मदद करता है ये जगह खतरनाक अलर्म को जागृत करती है कि लेवल वार्मी ग्लोबल वार्मिंग वास्तव में वास्तविक है कौन जानता है कि अंटार्कटिका फिर से गर्म होगा और अगर ऐसा होता भी है तो क्या हम इससे देखने के लिए जीवित होंगे सो दिस वॉज जर्नी टू द एंड ऑफ द अर्थ रिटर्न बाय तिशानी जोशी कम टू आर नेक्स्ट टॉपिक द एनिमी रिटर्न बाई पाल एस बाक Now we are going to discuss the enemy. The enemy written by Paul S. Buck. Introduction. It is time a world war an American prisoner of war is washed ashore in a dying state and is found at the doorstep of a Japanese doctor should he save him as the doctor or hand him over to the army as a patriot the story is said during the second world war a Japanese doctor finds an American POW at his doorstep he is in a dilemma that being a doctor should he save the wounded man or being a Japanese should he hand over the enemy to the army theme of the lesson the short tale theme the short tale the enemy by Paul Sbak tackles the subject of prejudice and its damaging impact on interpersonal relationships the plot centers on the connection between a Chinese doctor and an American soldier who are originally strangers amid a period of American war on Japan during the Second World War despite their difference in nationality the Japanese has to remain loyal Japanese doctor why is it mentioned Chinese the plot centers on the connection between a Japanese doctor and an American soldier who are originally strangers amid a period of American war on Japan during the Second World War despite their difference in nationality the Japanese has to remain loyal to his profession and thus saves the life of the injured enemy soldier however this does not go well despite their difference in nationality the Japanese has to remain loyal to his profession and thus saves the life of the injured enemy soldier However, this does not go well with his fellow men who considered him not to be loyal towards his country. The narrative shows us how the Japanese doctor Shadow. So, what is the name of the doctor? Name of the Japanese doctor Shadow. Okay. Shadow balances these two duties and emphasizes on the importance of humanity over everything else. So this was the enemy. Let's come to the next topic on the face of the Green Mountain Hill. On the face of it, On the face of it, let's first talk about the theme of the lesson. Susan Hill's short tale on the face of it addresses the subject of identity and constraints that society places on people. The narrative is set in England and centers on the struggles a young woman faces as she attempts to reconcile her identity with both her personal and societal standards. The main character is shown as being conflicted over her personal ambitions. an object is the role that society expects of her as a woman let's come to the introduction the story is about a teenage boy derry 
the story is about a teenage boy. What is his name? Daddy. The story is a teenage boy. Daddy who has a burnt face and Mr. Lamb who is a disabled old man. And uh, there is another old man. What is the name of that old man? Is Mr. Lamb. Mr. Lamb, who is a disabled old man with an artificial leg made of tin. Daddy accidentally enters his garden so that he can hide from people who hate him because of his ugly face. Mr. Lamb not only welcomes him in his garden but also encourages him to lead a normal life, leaving behind his past. On the face of it, summary, the story begins with a teenage boy entering a garden. His face is burned on one side due to an accident when an acid fell on half of his face. He was gone there to hide as he was afraid of facing people. He fears being teased by others for having such a face. But when he enters, he finds someone already present there. He tries to leave the place, but he is restored by the old man, Mr. Lamb, the owner of the garden. Daddy feels guilty for entering the garden without permission. Mr. Lamb welcomes him and tells him not to leave just because of his presence. Daddy wants to leave as he thinks people don't like his face and moreover, they get afraid of his looks. But Mr. Lamb insists he is there. They enter into a conversation that how Daddy is not liked by anyone and how he hates people behaving like this with him. Mr. Lamb tries to console him. He tells him that he has a thin leg, thin leg and kids make fun of him. Still, he is not depressed and enjoys this life. They both talk about various things and this leads to the revelation of Daddy's fear, depression, hatred about his being in such a condition. But Mr. Lamb keeps, and keeps on telling him to think of the positive things. Soon they become friends and Mr. Lamb asks him to and help him in plucking the crab apples of his garden. Daddy tells him that he had come too far from his home and hadn't told anything about this to his mother. Mr. Lamb tells him to take permission from his mother. Daddy finds it difficult and this leads to a small quarrel between both of them. At last, Daddy tells him that he would come back after taking his mother's permission. His mother does not want him to go back, but he comes back again to fulfill his promise. Meanwhile, Mr. Lamb climbs the ladder on his own to pluck the crab crab apples as he was sure that Daddy would not return. He was disabled and it was difficult for him to climb. Mr. Lamb falls from his ladder and dies. Daddy, on the other hand, returns to the garden to help him. When he enters the garden, he sees Mr. Lamb lying on the ground. Daddy tries hard to make him move but did not get any response from him. Finally, he comes to know that he is dead and starts crying. On the face of it, summary in Hindi, Kahani ek kishor ladke ke bagiche mein pravesh karne se shuru hoti hai. अधे चेहरे पर तेजब गिरने से हुए हादसे में उसका चेहरा एक तरफ एक तरफ जल गया है वो वहां छिपने के लिए गया है क्योंकि उसे लोगों का सामना करने का डर है उसे ऐसा चेहरा होने पर दूसरे द्वारा छेड़े जाने का डर है लेकिन जब वो गरीब बगीचे में प्रवेश करता है तो उसे पता चलता है कि वह कोई और भी मौजूद है वो उस जगह को छोड़ने की कोशिश करता है लेकिन उसे एक बूढ़ा आदमी जो कि बगीचे की मालिक मिस्टर लैम है रोक देता है डेडी बिना अनुमति के बगीचे में प्रवेश करने के लिए अपने आप को दोषी महसूस करता है मिस्टर लैम उसका स्वागत करते हैं और उससे कहते हैं कि केवल उनकी उपस्थिति के कारण वो बगीचे से न बगीचे से न जाए डेडी जाना चाहता है क्योंकि उसे लगता है कि लोगों को उसका चेहरा पसंद नहीं है और उसके अलावा उसके अलावा वो उसके रूप से डरते हैं डरते भी है लेकिन सीमन लैम जोर जोर देकर कहते हैं कि वो वही रहे वो एक बातचीत शुरू करते हैं कि कैसे डरी डरी को कोई पसंद नहीं करता है और कैसे वो लोगों के लोगों की ऐसे व्यवहार से नफरत करता है श्रीमान लैम उसे सांत्वना देने का प्रयास करते हैं वो उसे बताता है कि उनके पास एक दिन की टंग है एक दिन की टंग है और बच्चे उनका मजाक उड़ाते हैं फिर भी वो उदास नहीं है और अपने जीवन का आनंद लेता है वो दोनों विभिन्न चीजों के बारे में बात करते हैं और इससे डरी के डर अवसर और उसके इस तरह की स्थिति में होने के बारे में घृणा का खुलासा होता है लेकिन श्रीमान लैम उससे सकारात्मक बातों के बारे में सोचने के लिए कहते कहते रहते हैं जल्द ही वो दोस्त बन जाते हैं और श्रीमान लैम ने उसे अपने बगीचे के क्रिप एप्पल तोड़ने में मदद करने के लिए कहा डेडी उससे बताता है कि वो अपने घर से बहुत दूर आ गया था और उसने अपनी माँ को इस बारे में कुछ नहीं बताया था श्रीमान लैम ने उसे अपनी माँ से अनुमति लेने के लिए कहा डेडी को यह मुश्किल लगता है और 
इससे उन दोनों के बीच एक छोटा सा झगड़ा हो जाता है अंत में डेडी उससे कहता है कि वो अपनी माँ की अनुमति लेकर वापस आएगा उसकी माँ नहीं चाहती थी कि वो वापस जाए लेकिन वो अपना वादा पूरा करने के लिए फिर से वापस जा, आ जाता है इस बीच मिस्टर लैम क्रेम क्रेप एप्पल तोड़ने के लिए अकेले ही सीढ़ी पर चढ़ जाते हैं क्योंकि उन्हें यकीन था कि डॉरी डेरी वापस नहीं आएगा वो विकलांग था और उसके लिए सीढ़ी चढ़ना मुश्किल था मिस्टर लैम अपने सीढ़ी से गिर जाता है और मर जाता है दूसरी ओर डेरी उसकी मदद करने के लिए बगीचे में लौटता है जब वो बगीचे में प्रवेश करता है तो वो मिस्टर लैम को जमीन पर पड़ा हुआ देखता है डरी ने उससे खिलाने की बहुत कोशिश की लेकिन उसकी ओर से कोई प्रतिक्रिया नहीं मिली अंत में उससे पता चलता है कि वो मर चुका है और रोने लगता है सो दिस वॉज ऑन द फेस ऑफ इट नाउ लेट्स कम टू आर नेक्स्ट टॉपिक इवन प्राइस एंड ओ लेवल लेकिन बाई कोलिन डेक्सटर्ड Price and O11, written by Colin Dexter. Theme of the lesson: the plot of the story, even Price and O11, centers around a clever prison break that a prisoner orchestrates under the guise of taking a language test. Even after being discovered, the criminal escapes and enjoys the last laugh. The narrative also emphasizes the importance of being aware of one's opposition. Although the police officers were well prepared, they failed to account for Evans and his ability to trick them. In relation of the lesson to the lesson, the story Evans tries an O level is about a cunning prisoner Evans who makes a plan to escape from the prison on the day of his German language O level exam. The jail authorities, on the other hand, are ready to cover up any sort of risk. Will he be able to succeed in his escape? Evans tries an. Now let's talk about the summary. The story starts with a telephonic conversation between governor and the examination board secretary. The prison authorities want to conduct an O level exam in the German language for a prisoner named Evans. The secretary asks about the venue of the exam and also about the invigilator for it. The governor replies that the exam can be conducted in Evans cell and a chargeman will be appointed as the invigilator for the exam. They both then end their conversation by deciding on how and when the exam will be conducted. A senior prison officer Jackson visits Evans cell to conduct an inspection so that any weapon may be hidden. They are going through his checking because Evans had successfully escaped from prison earlier also. The episode gave him the name of Evans the Break. The governor was not ready to take any risks with this as it could bring a bad name to him. Jackson and Stephens checked the cell thoroughly. They had taken away his nail scissors earlier and Jackson ordered Stephens to take away his razor blade as soon as he had shaved jackson blade as soon as, as soon he had shaved jackson ordered evans to take off his hat but left it because evans requested him not to do so as it was his lucky hat for the exam all sorts of arrangements were made to keep a check on evans even a microphone was placed in his cell on the day of exam mc lady the chargeman reached the prison and was assisted to the cell by stephens the governor was informed that the exam was about to begin and that the cell did not have any weapons The governor ordered the officer to check the chargeman so that Evans may not use any belongings of MC Lady as a weapon. The chargeman and his belongings were searched. The paper knife was also removed so that Evans might not use it to injure the chargeman in order to escape. During the search, Jackson found one abnormal thing in the chargeman's bag. It was a semi-filled tube. When asked the reason for keeping it, MC Lady Lady said that he had to use it as he suffered from piles. The exam began and everything being spoken in the cell was constantly heard by the governor. Meanwhile, a phone call from the examination board for some corrections in the question paper made the governor suspicious. He cross-checked it by dialing the number again, which turned out to be busy. Then again, there was a phone call from the magistrate demanding for police officers and a fan. Such things were suspicious to the governor, but he calmed down as he was sure of his arrangements. Stephen stood outside the cell's cell and peeped inside after every minute. It was always the same, but later on, he noticed that Evans had put a blanket around himself. Though he doubted it at first, but then he stopped thinking much as it was cold inside the cell. Later on, the exam was conducted, and as governor ordered on the phone, Stephens accompanied MC Lady to the gate. Everything went as planned, and Stephens was happy. To be sure of himself, he once again went to the cell for a final look. He was shocked to see MC Lady lying in a pool of blood. Soon, he the news spread that Evans had injured the invigilator and had escaped from the jail by impersonating him. MC Lady, who was badly injured, was taken to governor as he had some important information. MC Lady told the governor about the. Photography being placed on the question paper, which shared the escape plan, shared the escape plan with Evans. The 
the governor tried to decode the German language and found out found out that Ifans would reach Newbury after his j- jailbreak. Soon, Superintendent Carter was called and MC Lady was sent with him to catch Ifans. Both Jackson and Stephens were scolded for being unaware about Ifans having a false beard and the church man's belongings in his cell. He then ordered both of them to go to St. Alder's police station and meet Chief Inspector Bell. Meanwhile, Carter called him up to inform that they had missed Evans while chasing him and that MC Lady was sent to Radcliffe Hospital. The governor called up the hospital and came to know that they had sent an ambulance to the examination board, but the charge man had already disappeared. He understood the whole plan that MC Lady, who was helping them to search Evans, was in fact Evans himself. Soon, the real MC Lady was also found by the police who was tied up at, the, at his house. On the <coughs> On the other hand, Evans had reached Hotel Golden Lion and was enjoying his freedom. When he reached the hotel room, he found the governor in his room. He told Evans that he had all of his men around, so there was no chance for him for escape again. The governor asked him about his plan, and Evans told every bit of it to him. Finally, the prison van was called to take Evans to the prison. The governor felt proud of catching him again. As soon as the van started, the prisoner officer unlocked Evans' handcuffs and asked the driver to drive fast so that the police could not catch them again. Finally, Evans once again managed to escape from the clutches of the police with the help of his friends. Evans tries an level of this summary in Hindi. Kahani, Rajyapal, or Pariksha Board, Sachip Ke Beach, Telephone Par, Badjit Se Shuru Hoti Hai, Jail Adhikaro. इवांस नाम एक के एक कैदी के इवांस इवांस नाम के एक कैदी के लिए जर्मन भाषा में ऑल लेवल परीक्षा आयोजित करना चाहते हैं सचिव परीक्षा के स्थान और इसके लिए निरीक्षक के बारे में भी पूछता है राज्यपाल जवाब देता है कि परीक्षा इवांस के जेल में आयोजित की जा सकती है और एक चर्चमैन को परीक्षा के लिए निरीक्षक के रूप में नियुक्त किया जाएगा फिर वह दोनों परीक्षा कैसे और कब आयोजित की जाएगी वो तय करके अपनी बातचीत समाप्त करता है एक वरिष्ठ जेल अधिकारी जैक्सन निरीक्षण करने के लिए इवांस के सेल का दौरा करता है ताकि कई भी हथियार छिपाया ना जा सके वो जांच इसलिए की गई क्योंकि इवांस पहले भी जेल से सफल पूर्वक भाग चुके थे इस प्रकरण ने उन्हें इवांस के इवांस इवांस द ब्रेक नाम का नाम दिया ये जांच इसलिए की गई क्योंकि इवांस पहले भी जेल से सफल पूर्वक भाग चुके थे इस प्रकरण ने उन्हें इवांस द ब्रेक नाम दिया गया नाम दिया उन्होंने पहले उसके नेल कटर छीन ली थी और जैक्सन ने स्टीफन्स को आदेश दिया कि जैसे ही वो वो शेप कर ले तब उसका रेजर ब्लेड हटा ले जैक्सन ने इवांस को अपनी टोपी उतारने का आदेश दिया लेकिन उससे उससे छोड़ दिया क्योंकि इवांस ने उससे ऐसा ना करने का अनुरोध किया क्योंकि वो परीक्षा के लिए उसकी उसकी भाग्यशाली टोपी थी इवांस पर नज़र रखने के लिए हर तरह की व्यवस्था की गई थी यहाँ तक कि उनके सेल में एक एक माइक्रोफोन भी रखा गया था परीक्षा के दिन मेक मेक लेडी चर्चमैन जेल पहुँचा और स्टीफन्स ने उन्हें इवांस के सेल तक असिस्ट किया राज्यपाल को बताया गया कि परीक्षा शुरू होने वाली है और इवांस के पास कई हथियार नहीं है गवर्नर ने अधिकारी को चार्जमैन की जांच करने का आदेश दिया ताकि इवांस मेक लेडी के किसी भी सामान को हथियार के रूप में इस्तेमाल ना कर सके चार्जमैन और उसका सामान की तलाशी ली गई पेपर नाइफ को भी हटा दिया गया ताकि इवांस इसका इस्तेमाल चार्जमैन को घायल करने के लिए इस्तेमाल ना कर सके तलाशी के दौरान जैक्सन को चार्जमैन के बैग में एक, एक असामान्य चीज़ मिली वो एक अर्धा भरी हुई ट्यूब थी इसे रखने का कारण पूछे जाने पर मैकलेडी ने कहा कि उन्हें इसका इस्तेमाल करना था क्योंकि वो बाबा सिर से प्रेरित थे परीक्षा शुरू हुई और सेल में वाल में बोली जाने वाली हर बात राज्यपाल द्वारा सुनी जाती रही इस बीच प्रश्न पत्र में कुछ सुधार के लिए परीक्षा बोर्ड के एक फोन कॉल ने राज्यपाल को संदेहा संदेह बना दिया उन्होंने दोबारा नंबर डायल कर क्रॉस चेक किया जो 
व्यस्त निकला फिर दोबारा पुलिस अधिकारियों और बैन की मांग करते हुए मजिस्ट्रेट का फोन आया ऐसी बातों राज्यपाल को संदेश संदेह संदेहास्पद लग रही थी लेकिन वो अपनी व्यवस्था के प्रति आश्वस्त होने के कारण शांत हो गए स्टीफेंस सेल के बाहर खड़ा था और हर मिनट के बाद अंदर झांक रहा था लेकिन कुछ देर बाद में उसने देखा कि इवंस ने अपने चारों ओर एक केबल डाल दिया था हालांकि पहले तो उन्हें इस पर शक हुआ लेकिन फिर उन्होंने ज्यादा सोचने बंद कर दिया क्योंकि सेल के अंदर ठंड थी बाद में परीक्षा आयोजित की गई और जिससे ही राज्यपाल ने फोन पर आदेश दिया स्टीफेंस मेक लॉडी के साथ गेट तक गए सब कुछ योजना के अनुसार हुआ और स्टीफेंस खुश था खुद पर यकीन करने के लिए वो एक बार फिर अंतिम दर्शन के लिए सेल में गए मैक लॉडी को खून से लथ लथपथ देख वो चौक गया जल्द ही वो खबर फैल गई कि इवांस ने निरीक्षक को घायल कर दिया था और उसी प्रति रूपित रूपित करके जेल से भाग गया था मैक लॉडी लेडी जो बुरी तरह से घायल हो गए थे उन्हें राज्यपाल के पास ले जाया गया क्योंकि उनके पास कुछ महत्वपूर्ण जानकारी थी मेक लेडी ने राज्यपाल को प्रश्न पत्र पर राखी जा रही फोटोकॉपी के बारे में बताया जिसमें इवांस के साथ भागने के योजना सजा ही गई थी गवर्नर ने जर्मन भा, भाषा को डिकोड करने की कोशिश की और पता चला कि इवांस अपने जेल ब्रेक के बाद न्यू बड़ी पहुंचे पहुंचेंगे जल्द ही अधिकक कटर को बुलाया गया और इवांस को पकड़ने के लिए मेक लेडी की उनके साथ भेजा गया जैक्सन और स्टीफन्स दोनों को इवांस की झूठी दाढ़ी और उसके सेल में चर्च के सामान के बारे में अनजान होने के लिए डांटा गया था फिर उसने उसने उन दोनों को सेंट एल्डेट्स पुलिस स्टेशन जाने और मुख्य निरीक्षक वेल से मिलने का आदेश दिया इस बीच कार्टर ने उसे वो सूचित करने के लिए फोन किया कि वो उसका पीछा करते हुए इवंस से चुप गए थे और मेकलेडी को रेड रेड क्लिफ अस्पताल अस्पताल भेज गया था राज्यपाल ने अस्पताल को फोन किया और पता चला कि उन्होंने परीक्षा बोर्ड को एक एम्बुलेंस भेजी थी लेकिन चर्चमैन पहले ही गायब हो चुका था वो पूरी योजना को समझ गया था कि मेक लड़ी जो उन्हें इवंस को खोजने में मदद कर रहा था वास्तव में इवंस ही थे जल्द ही असली मेक लड़ी भी पुलिस को मिल गई जो उसके घर पर बंधी हुई थी दूसरी ओर इवंस सेन होटल गोल्डन लायन पहुंचे थे और अपनी आजादी का आनंद ले रहे थे जब वो होटल के कमरे में पहुंचे तो उन्होंने राज्यपाल को अपना कमरे में पाया उसने इवंस से कहा कि उसके पास उसके सभी आदमी हैं इसलिए उसके लिए फिर से बचना बचने का कहीं मौका नहीं था गवर्नर ने उनसे उनकी योजना के बारे में पूछा और इवंस ने उन्हें इसके बारे में बताया अंत में इवंस को जेल ले जाने के लिए जेल बैन को बुलाया गया राज्यपाल ने उसे फिर से पकड़ गर्व महसूस किया जैसे ही वो शुरू भैन शुरू हुई जेल अधिकारी ने इवंस की हथकड़ी खोली दी और ड्राइवर को तेज गाड़ी चलाने को कहा ताकि पुलिस उन्हें दोबारा पकड़ ना सके अंत में इवंस एक बार फिर अपने दोस्त की मदद से पुलिस की चंगुल से भागने में सफल रहा सो दिस वॉज इवंस टाइजन ओ लेवल नाउ लेट्स टॉक अवर चाइल्ड मेमोरीज ऑफ चाइल्ड हुड जीतकला सैन बामा कटिंग ऑफ माई लॉन्ग हेयर रिटर्न बाई जीत कला सा कटिंग ऑफ माई लॉन्ग हेयर जीत कला सा 
the first day in the land of apples was a bitter cold one for the snow still covered the ground and the trees are bare a large bell rang for breakfast its loud metallic voice crashing through the blade belfry overhead into our sensitive ears the annoying clatter of shoes on bare floors gave us no peace the constant clash of harsh noises with an undercurrent of many voices murmuring an unknown tongue made a bedlam within which I was sure securely tied. And though my spirit tore itself in struggling for its lost freedom, all was useless. A pale-faced woman with white hair came up after us. We were placed in a line of girls who were marching into the dining room. And these were Indian girls in stiff shoes and closely clinging dresses. The small girls wore sleeved aprons and single hair. As I walked noiselessly in my soft moccasins, I felt like sinking to the floor, for my blanket had been stripped from my shoulders. I looked hard at the Indian girls who, who seemed not to care that they were even more immodestly dressed than I in their tightly fitting clothes. While we marched in, the boys entered at an opposite door. I was for the three young braves who came in our party. I spied them in the rear ranks looking as uncomfortable as I felt, a small bell was taped and each of the pupils drew a chair from under the table. Supposing this act meant they were to be seated, I pulled out mine and at once slipped into it from one side. But when I turned my head, I saw that I was the only one seated and all the rest at our table remained standing. Just as I began to rise, looking shyly around to see how chairs were to be used, a second bell was sounded. All were seated at last, and I had to crawl back into my chair again. I heard a man's voice at one end of the hall, and I looked around to see him, but all the others hung their heads over their plates. As I glanced at the long chain of tables, I caught the eyes of a pale-faced woman upon me. Immediately I dropped my eyes, wondering why I was so keenly watched by the strange woman. The man ceased his mutterings, and then a third bell was tapped. Everyone picked up of his knife and fork and began eating. I began crying instead for by this time I was afraid to venture anything more. But this eating by formula was not the hardest trial in that first day late in the morning. My friend Judwin gave me a terrible warning. Judwin knew a few words of English and she had overheard the pale faced woman talk about cutting our long heavy hair. Our mothers had taught us that only unskilled warriors who were captured had their hair shingled by the enemy. Among our people short hair was owned by mourners and shingled hair by cowards. We discussed our fate some moments, and when Jorwin said, We have to submit because they are strong, I rebelled. No, I will not submit. I will struggle fast. I answered. I watched my chance, and when no one noticed, I disappeared. I crept up the stairs as quietly as I could in my squeaking shoes. My moccasins had been exchanged for shoes. All along the hall, I passed without knowing whither I was going. Turning aside to an open door, I found a large room with three white beds in it. The windows were covered with dark green curtains, which made the room very dim. Thankful that no one was there, I directed my steps toward the corner farthest from the door. On my hands and knees, I crawled under the bed and huddled myself in the dark corner. From my hiding place, I peered out, shuddering with fear whenever I heard footsteps nearby, though in the hall loud voices were calling my name, and I knew that that even Jedwin was searching for me. I did not open my mouth to answer. Then the steps were quickened and the voices became excited. The sounds came nearer and nearer. Women and girls entered the room. I held my breath and I held my breath and watched them open closet doors and peep behind large trunks. Someone threw up the curtains and the room was filled with sudden light. What caused them to stoop and look under the bed? I do not know. I remember being dragged out, though I resisted by kicking and scratching wildly. In spite of myself, I was carried downstairs and tied fast in a chair. I cried aloud, shaking my head all the while until I felt the cold blades of the scissors against my neck and heard them gnaw off one of my thick braids. Then I lost my spirit since the day I was taken from my mother. I had suffered extreme indignities. People had stared at me. I had been tossed about in the air like a wooden puppet, and now my long hair was shingled like a coward's. In my anguish, I mourned for a mother, but no one came to comfort him. Not a soul reasoned quietly with me as my own mother used to do, for now I was only one of many little animals driven by a herder. Now I am going to read We Two Are Human Beings, written by Bama. 
when I was studying in the third class, I heard an eight hard people speak openly of untouchability. But I had already seen, failed experience and been humiliated by what it is. I was walking home from school one day, an old bag hanging from my shoulder. It was actually possible to walk the distance in 10 minutes, but usually it would take me 30 minutes at the very least to reach home. It would take me from half an hour to an hour to dwell along, watching all the fun and games that were going on, all the entertaining novelties, what it is in the, the streets, the shops and the bazaar, the performing monkey, the snake, which the snake charmer kept in its box and displayed from time to time, the cyclist who had not got off his bike for three days and who kept pedaling as hard as he could from break up day, the rupee notes that were pinned onto his shirt to spur him on, the spinning wheels, the Mariatta temple, the huge bell hanging there, the pongal offerings being put in front of the temple, the dried fish stalled by the statue of Gandhi, the sweet stall, the stall selling, selling fried snacks and, and, all the, and all the other shops next to each other, the street light always demonstrating how it could change from blue to violet, the Nariku Bharan, hunter's gypsy with his wild lemur in cages, selling needles clay beads and instruments for clinging for cleaning out the ears on oh i could go on and on each thing would pull me to a stand still and not allow me to go any further at times people from various political parties would arrive put up a stage and harangue, harangue us through their mics then there might be a street play or a puppet show or a no magic no miracle a stand performance all this would happen from na from time to time but almost certainly there would be some entertainment or other going on even otherwise there were the coffee clubs in the bazaar the way each waiter pulled the coffee lifting a tumbler high up and putting its contents into a tumbler held in his other hand or the way some people sat in front of the shops chopping up onion, their eyes turned elsewhere so that they could not smart, or the almond tree grew there and its fruit which was occasionally blown down by the wind. All these sights taken together would tether, tether my legs and stop me from going home. And then according to the lesson, there would be mango, cucumber, sugarcane, sweet potato, palm shoots, gram, palm syrup and palm food, guavas and jackfruit. Every day I would see people selling sweet and savory fried snacks, payasam, halva, boiled tamarind, seeds and iced lollies. Gazing at all this, one day I came to my street, my back slung over my shoulder at the opposite corner, though a threshing floor had been set up and the landlord watched the proceedings, seated on a piece of shaking spread over a stone ledge. Our people were hard at work, driving cattle in pairs round and round to train out the grain from the straw. The animals were muzzled so that they wouldn't help themselves to the straw. I stood for a while there, watching the fun. Just then, an elder of our street came along from the direction of the bazaar. The manner in which he was walking along made me want to double up. I wanted to shriek with laughter at the sight of such a big man carrying a small packet in that fashion. I guess there was something like badai or green banana bhaji in the pocket but because the wrapping paper was stained with oil. Uh, he came along holding out the packet by a string without touching it. I stood there thinking to myself, if he holds it like that, won't the package come undone and the bathers fall out? The elder went straight up to the landlord, bowed low and extended the packet towards him, cupping the hand that held the string with his other hand. The, the landlord opened the parcel and began to eat the bathers. Badais. After I had watched all this, at last I went home. My elder brother was there. I told him the story in all its comic detail. I fell out with laughter at the memory of a big man and an elder at that, at that making such a game out of carrying the parcel. But An um, Annan was not amused. Annan told me the man wasn't being funny when he carried the package like that. He said everybody did believe that they were upper caste and therefore must not touch us. If they did, they would be polluted. That's why he had to carry the package by its string. When I heard this, I didn't want to laugh anymore and I felt terribly sad. How could they believe that it was disgusting if one of us held that package in his hands, even though the bhadai had been wrapped first in a banana leaf and then parceled in paper? I felt so provoked and angry that I wanted to charge those wretched bhadais myself straight away. Why should we have to fetch and carry for these people? I wonder, such an important elder of ours goes meeky to the shops to fetch snacks and hands them over reverently, bowing and singing to this fellow who just sits there and stuffs them into his mouth. The thought of it infuriated me. How was it that these fellows thought so much of themselves because they had scrapped four coins together? Did that mean they must lose all human feelings? But we two are human beings. Our people should never run these petty errands for these fellows. We should work in their fields, take home our wages and leave it at that. My elder brother, who was studying at university, had come home for the holidays. He would often go to the library in our neighboring village in order to borrow books. He was on his way home one day, walking along the banks of the irrigation tank. One of the landlord's men came up behind him. He thought my Annan looked unfamiliar and so he asked, Who are you? Appa, what's your name? Ar Ar Annan told him his name. Immediately, the other man asked, 
Tham Vi on which street do you live? The point of this was that if he knew on which street we live, he would know our caste too. Anand told me all these things and he added, because we are born into this community, we are never given any honor or dignity or respect. We are stripped of all that. But if we study and make progress, we can throw away these indignities. So study with care, learn all you can. If you are always ahead in your lessons, people will come to you of their own accord and attach themselves to you. Work hard and learn. The words that Anand spoke to me that they made a very deep impression on me and I studied hard with all my breath and being in a frenzy almost as Anand had asked. I stood fast in my class and because of that many people became my friends. So this was the this was the text. We are two human beings and I completed the whole book Vistas. Thank you. See you in our next class.